Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. I thank you that your name is glorious. Thank you that your word is true. We stand in awe of your of your of your tabernacle tonight, Lord. Glad to be in the house of God, just like David said. And the apostles that knew that they were near you got to see the, the transfiguration. It said it is good for us to be here. And they said it was that didn't our hearts move within us when he spoke those words when your son was speaking even on earth hearts were moved with eternal passion heavenly father i pray that hearts would be moved that there would be no denomination there would be no doctrine some per se to override the reality of a, a life hidden in christ Lord, I pray that there be more expression rather than explanation of the reality of the New Testament church overtaken by your awesome presence, overtaken by your great love, hearts filled with song and filled with passion and compassion for the, those that are lost. Heavenly Father, breathe fresh wind upon your church May the dove of the Holy Spirit come, Lord, and reveal Christ in a miracle way to every heart. Help us to remember what the New Testament church is all about and what happened on that old rugged cross over 2,000 years ago. Would you take your praise in this time, dear Heavenly Father? In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. So it will be Revelation chapter 18 today and a little bit of 19 that will finish the horror of Babylon. It was a little bit tricky as I'm looking at this, and it just, the more I look at it, the more I was getting confused. And I was hoping to just, you know, I want to develop it further, but tonight I'm going to, it's, it's, it's really not that complicated. It's just that the verbiage is a little bit tricky. As we looked through 17 last time, got to get pretty familiar with what the Whore of Babylon really is. And it's really just, the spirit of Babylon, the beast system that's never not been ever since the Tower of Babel. There's always been a super leader on the earth as Satan cannot lead without a human being. It's interesting how this collaboration of spiritual laws between the spirit world and a human being. And when they want to think like Satan, they get to work with Satan. And they want to, people want to hide away and think they're, let their mind get into track with God. And then that will attract the Holy Spirit. It's all a matter of who's going to be on track with whichever spirit you want. Get taken over by what you can see and you'll be taken over by Satan. Get taken over by the kingdom of God and his word and you'll be taken over by the Holy Spirit. We all have to make up our mind, which spirit are we going to take? The path of righteousness or the path of this world? If we have the path to heaven isn't something you can see with your naked eye. And the Christian church needs to remember that the naked eye Christianity is a cult. You can look at all the Bible believing Christianity throughout the last 2000 years and it breaks down into three things. Roman Catholicism, evangelicalism and cults. Ones that don't believe in traditional doctrines. They don't believe Jesus is God. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe in the very basic things that we can clearly see in the New Testament. In the book of Acts, that describes the New Testament church as it's supposed to be seen in, in a healthy position. And I lovingly curse the thought of calling it something other than it really is. We have to leave it as it is. The church is supposed to be a supernatural church. She was never supposed to be an analytical or purely emotional. And it is terrifying to know that some of the strongest leaders are, are bringing forth something that is a hideous doctrine that doesn't allow the human race to be body, soul, and spirit. They say that soul and spirit is the same thing. And I say the devil is a liar because the Bible says the word of God is sharper than in any two-edged sword, rightly dividing joint from marrow and soul from spirit. And I say that's one of the biggest problems of American Christianity or even ac across the globe is when we do not divide soul from spirit. And now we have a doctrine among a lot of strong, godly looking men. And I say, I love them all and I respect them for their strengths, but that is a lie. 
soul from spirit must be divided or the Christianity will continue to plummet into into a, 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 a many excuses of why we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. Many excuses why we are doing what we're not supposed to be doing. And everybody has their specific yeas and nays in their own personal life, their own church, their own family, their own understanding. But we're not supposed to lean to our own understanding. We're supposed to trust in the Lord and lean not to our own understanding. If we want to be New Testament church people who are actually right with God and not just what it's been explained to us. Christianity isn't something we, we to explain. It's supposed to be expressed with the life of God in us as we walk with him as children in Eden. So when you look at the Whore of Babylon, you see at the end of chapter 16, which I'm actually going to mention this here really quick, because it says, it says in the last of it, at the end of 16, which is the seven vials, remember, and then the 17 started with one of the seven vial angels talking to to our dear John here on Patmos. And now we have a more correct picture where he's actually looking kind of old because when this actually happened, he was quite old. So this is probably more keeping to the, to the true text. But let's look at the seventh angel as he pours out his vial. In verse 17, we're gonna look at just the end of 16 to make a point because you're going to see some interesting language throughout 17, 18, and 19. But it actually starts in 16, about the whore here. It says, And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, from heaven down into the earth, over all the earth. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. We know that there's so many things like the greatest preacher, John the Baptist, the wisest was Solomon. There's a lot of different things that was nothing ever better, nothing through, through, through before or after them and ever. And this is the greatest earthquake as we've ever seen. And then it says, such as was since men, such as was not since men was upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. The last trumpet or the last vial, excuse me. And the last and the great city. OK, there's that great city. That's one we're going to remember. The great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. God's like, okay, I'm remembering something that's been on the plate for a long time. This horrifying spiritual Babylon. And you're going to see a connection between the political and the religious. And so it's, it, it get, that's why it gets confusing. But he's recognizing, he's recognizing the issue here and saying, time's up. And we're going to find out that the time has been up for a long time. And it's just the mercy of God that has it absolutely slaughtered all these wicked people who chose the wrong path. They chose to tune into the world ways and not the ways of God. And now they're going to pay for it severely because God is not playing around here. And it says, and every island fled away and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great. So that's a lot happening. The greatest earthquake the world has ever known from that seventh vial poured out of wrath. This is the final of the 777, the final wrath part of it. And it says that we have a massive earthquake and extremely horrifying hail that people were just getting pulverized by. You can think about the size of these things, the weight of a talent. So, I mean, like Thanksgiving turkeys falling from heaven by the thousands. And hitting things and just, I mean, the velocity of these things coming down would just absolutely destroy vehicles and destroy homes and everything. And it's going to be really horrible. And this is also when Christ is coming down, too, at the end of this. So it looks like they're all kind of coming at the same time. But it also shows that every island and fled away and all the mountains were not found because when there's oceans happening, when there's earthquakes happening, it causes like tsunamis or something. And then the oceans would cover up even mountains. It's going to be just a disaster. The final blow is going to be water, hail and earthquake. And then Christ coming on the white horse 
all seeming like at the very at the very end of that seven the seven vials so that's the context right there but i wanted to go also before we would jump into 18 17 18 and 19. you can look through here it says it 13 mentions of the whore in 17 alone and it uses the word great whore fornication or her fornication the wine of her fornication or woman so the 17 is kind of like the whore and woman and then you go over to 18 and it's saying like babylon but it also says her her and she like 20 something times it's just tons of times but the one thing that kind of connects it to which was helping me not confuse the two is that they both say great city you say great city in 16 great city in 17 great city in 18 and i i think that it's going to be a great city here in 19 okay at least the three we'll see the great city so the whore of babylon is simply the real the false religion that has been birthed from the spiritual babylon so this is like rome on top of rome babylon on top of babylon political and religious and the whole world has been hurt by it and we know there has to be a separation because in 17 it said that the horns or the kings of the system hated the whore and they destroyed her and ate her flesh it's what it says it's horrifying so that gives us a little bit of premise 18 and 19 is pretty simple doesn't need a whole lot of explanation like 17 needed a ton of it but i also want to remember remember chapter 12 when it was giving you the history of israel from the birthing of you know, the nativity of Christ being born of the Virgin, it showed her, oh, well, because she's from Israel, so it's Christ coming from Israel. And then it goes into the whole pattern all the way up until the wrath of God, which we just saw when, when Jerusalem's about ready to get slaughtered and, and then God comes and destroys all these armies coming against Jerusalem. It's the whole history. 12 is all the history of Israel. Chapter 13 was another one of those up-to-date kind of get you up to speed chapters about the antichrist and the false prophet and the mark of the beast it was kind of like not really in uh, line but it kind of gives you some background and then some perspective 17 18 and 19 is kind of the same thing because it's a perspective about the horror a lot more though leading right to the judgment because when christ comes down on the horse is about the same time as this at the end of the seven the seven 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 anyway so it's just giving you three, two and a half chapters of perspective of the whore of Babylon, which is the religious system connected to the super, which is connected to the superpower system. So that it's, it's not only just satanic and evil. Now it's like deceptively false, religiously evil, where they do not divide soul from spirit. But I tell you the truth, religion in the eyes of God is like intimacy between man and wife. It's the marriage bed between man and wife to God. So when anybody who God has created as his own children, ultimately to be a bride, and if they want to follow any type of mindset that is not the true covenant, it is a whore. So that would even include atheists and agnostics and whoever, any kind of religion at all. He says it's like you're sleeping with the enemy. If anybody has marriage, you know that if your spouse was pairing off at all with someone else, the jealousy factor is absolutely indescribable. Any little thing they do and the jealousy will reign supreme in your heart. Same as when anybody will compromise even a little bit in false religion. God hates, God hates the cheating. He hates the whoredom. And anybody who follows it, you're following the whore of Babylon who has been birthed by the system of Satan, the Antichrist system that's been reigning throughout all of world history. That's Babylon. So Babylon seems to have two different meanings. Very, very interesting how the how the the horror takes on the name so much that she is Mystery Babylon. She's the great mother of all harlots and abominations of all the earth. So she's kind of like so unified with Babylon that she's even called Babylon. She's called spiritual Babylon. It's 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 crazy. It's that's why it gets so confusing because the religious side is Babylon and the other side is Babylon, political and religious. And they mix together as if they're almost the same thing. So 17, 18, and 19, it mentions the horror in different ways. The woman, she, her, the great city, Babylon, over and over again. So let's go ahead and look at the chapter 18 now with a little bit of a, a warm-up there. So after, 
after it shows the great kings eating the flesh of the whore because what I call it kind of like an inside job, okay? You know the scripture that says, and I think it's the Psalms where it says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered, amen? And what happens is when God is reigning supreme among his people, he has a power and a, the, the rules where he can actually scatter the enemies. They will never be able to hurt you. All the assignments of Satan will be canceled when God is truly arising among his people. God will easily come up and say, I'll scatter the enemies. They'll be trying to attack you, but they'll be attacking themselves. Okay. So throughout history, like we talked about, the whore has, she's the mother of all harlots. Now it's not only spiritual harlots, it's also political harlots or like even socialistic harlots like Nazism and Islam and also communism and also the Masonic Lodge or the four daughters of Rome and all four that came from Rome come back and attacked Rome. So even though she birthed them, the, the daughter come and attacked the mom, so to speak. Because, and that's the same thing we saw at the end of 17. Like the kings birthed this thing and then eventually they hated and they killed the whore. So the ending of the whore as we see it is not just God's judgment. God allows some of that judgment to come against each other. It's kind of an imploding as well as the wrath of God after that. And you can remember how God likes to do that too. Like in Isaiah 19 verse one, it shows the Lord spreading his wings over Egypt and it causes the Egyptians hearts to be fearful like the heart of a woman. Their hearts became hearts of women and they were fearful and they began to kill each other. Just like Gideon coming against the 36,000 Amalekites, they didn't have any weapons, but they stood there and did what God told them to do. And God caused 36,000 people to kill each other. It's another inside job. Well, this is the same thing that happened at the end of 17. It was an inside job type of a thing where what, like what come from Rome ended up coming back and attacking Rome or actually being killed by Rome because they are the ones who ate her flesh. The whore was removed and then God kills them all anyway. So ultimately it's different types of destructions that you'll see throughout world history. The walls of Jericho coming down, you'll see the destruction coming in, in different ways, the fire coming down from heaven, different types of wrath on earth which is separate from the eternal wraths, which we can clearly see in scripture. We'll cover that another time. The difference, of course, it should be clear when it says eternal burnings, it's not the wrath of God on earth, it's in the earth eternally. 18 verse one, and after these things, after the kings killed the whore, I saw another angel. So this is not the vile angel, it's a different one. It's an angel with the vile, it's not, it's not the wrath angels, it's a separate one. Come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. And what you'll see here in 17, 18, 19, a lot of times it's talking like it's already fallen or it shall be coming to fall. So it's giving you both done and coming soon kind of verbiage. So Babylon has fallen and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So this is a description like we often will see in Revelation earlier on. It had the church falling into fornication, sexual perversion, said that is the depths of Satan. Any type of sexual impurity is considered the, is considered the depths of Satan and it's become the habitation of devils. And you know that they're the promoter of all this stuff. Not only are they spiritual horrors, but they can, can, they can convey a message that will tear families apart. And when families fall apart, they fall into all kinds of perversion, sexual perversion. The marriage is not going right. There's no romance in the family. Adultery happens like almost 99% of the time, adultery and other kind of weird things happen is because the marriage is not romantic as God has, has wants it to be. That's his will. Non-romantic marriages, like I said, is not the will of God. It's become the habitation of devils, ripping families apart, perverting the view of, of the nation and everything else. And a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So it's uncleanness and it's hateful. Like it says, it says that as iniquity shall abound, the love of many will grow cold. And this is going to be normal among the world. There's going to be a lot of people. It's all selfishness. People are just creepy and evil. There's like no rules. It's the land of the lawless. It's like, you know, wild, wild west and everything. It's really, really deadly, really dangerous. 
For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Okay, so it says, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. They're all in it together. Fornication means false religion, ignoring the covenant that God has currently laid out, which is clearly Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ is the covenant. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through her, the abundance of her delicacy. So it's got, you got the financial and you have the religious, and they're both, they have drunk of the wine of her fornication. So it's like the fornication represents false religion and then financial. Like we remember in 13, it shows the religious, the political, and the financial, the mark of the beast. So it's got three different things. Now it's showing two of the three right there. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. So that's clearly God. That ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Meaning we do have to stop sinning in order to not be in jeopardy with God. That should be real clear if we really get to stay in the word. Amen. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Just like we saw in 16, he remembered her sins, and now it's time to unleash the wrath. Okay. Now, we already saw the wrath happen in 16, as we clearly see. or it was a gonna, It's going to be overlapping. But we already saw it in 14 as well. We saw it in... 12 as well so we, we can see it and it's going to be in, in 19 as well which we're not going to touch that but it, it's the same thing when christ comes down on the white horse and it shows it in different ways of him protecting jerusalem and destroying the armies coming against her for her sins have reached unto heaven and god hath remembered her sin reward her even as she has rewarded you give her back what she has done to you and double unto her double according to her works meaning her cup of iniquity is radically full, in the cup which she hath filled. So horrible. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. Maybe he's talking to an angel, pouring, about ready to dump it out, because it's about ready to happen, you know, as the horse comes down and the hail and the earthquake. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. The pride people get when they get blessed of God, and or they're, they're carrying on in ways that is not even of God. But sometimes God doesn't stop people. That happens to the world, and they carry on thinking, I don't need any God. I, I got everything I need right here. I, I'm a queen. I'm, I'm great. Nothing ever bad will ever happen to me. That is one of the worst traps of Satan there ever was. So much success that you don't think you know, need God is horrifying. I, I, I equate it to this, that spirit of, I call it the Inspector Gadget spirit. When Inspector Gadget like is one of the most ingenious films or TV shows I've ever seen. I never thought of it before, but it's, it's a funny process. It's the guy who is literally, he's so ridiculously wrong about everything. He assesses every crime wrong and he goes about it all wrong. And yet there's someone else behind the scenes, little Penny, doing everything and fixing it. And then he gets all the credit for it. She doesn't even take the credit. You know, and that's the same as a foolish Christian who just somehow gets through while the Holy Spirit's trying to protect him and give him more time to get right with him and thinks everything's just fine. Nothing will ever go wrong. She says, I sit a queen. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. Never even realizes how, how, how much danger she's in and shall see no sorrow. That's what her heart is. It's a heart of an incredible pride love of many grows cold just so much pride and that's the spirit of this whole horror the whole great city if you will therefore shall her plagues come in one day death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong is the lord god who judgeth her it's going to happen it says it's going to happen in an hour a lot of stuff all in one day that's pretty severe and the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her. When she goes down, it's going to ruin all their lives. All the evil people. It's one of the main things about this whole chapter is that you're going to see all the evil people of the world and how all these businesses of all these flourishing businesses all come crumbling down in an hour because God is 
dangerous when you don't do what he wants you to do. And all their things that they thought never could go wrong. We live deliciously. Nothing could ever go wrong. Well, it's all going to be dead in an hour. And now when she goes down, it's connected to all their finances. It's global finance. It's global government. It's global religion. And it seems strange. Like when you see something so evil fall, sometimes you think, well, you know, like the wicked witch of Wizard of Oz and she dies and everybody's like, wow, great. Our witch is dead. Now we have freedom now. But that's not what happens here. It's it, they're wailing over it, you know. Like even when the communist leader, the one before, before the one now, and when he died, everybody was just weeping and wailing. They they actually like have the most horrible lives, but they they've been trained to fall in love with something so evil. It's very very scary. They committed spiritual fornication and lived deliciously with her, and shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Very radical change that will be happening there, clearly. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Even they're just like going, wow, I can't believe it's over. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Everybody's done. Everything they put their confidence, God just wipes it out in an hour, lets them know, you've never been in charge, I have. You guys had so much pride in nothing. You guys were sitting on nothing. That's how blind and ridiculous you are. I told you, I, my son died on the cross for you to pay for your crimes, and you didn't even acknowledge them. That's how foolish and wicked you are. Anyone who continues in sin is is foolish like this, falling into this living in those Christian religions that don't even divide soul from spirit. When God says his word does do that in order for us to have a real religion where we're not fornicating with the devil, we're actually, we're actually having a religious experience with Jesus Christ and paying the real price for it. There's, there's no price for the, when you don't have to divide soul from spirit, there is not, a, there's not much of a cost there. Just be a good person, go to church and everybody will think you're fine. It's not what God says. Narrow is the way that leadeth to life. It's the supernatural path. Don't see with the naked eye. Don't see it with a lot of these modern churches either. In verse 12, merchandise of gold and of silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and uh, all thion wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. Just going down the list of all their commodities and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Had to throw that souls of men in there because it's a lot more than that. They're, they're not only like there's a book out right now from Megan something, Wabash or something. I forgot her last name. And she wrote a book called Shepherds for, Sa Shepherds for Sale. And so it's teaching about how there's a lot of liberal preachers out there that are being sold. They're selling themselves out there, being, being paid by the left wing in order to be paid off by the evil and start to compromise the word of God. And so that's a big old fuss going on because she's a pretty famous lady naming names and writing them all in her book. And so there's a big old controversy going right there, but it's like the souls of men are being sold into this. Not only the products, but these people's souls are like another product. It's like these, that's the way Satan will hurt God. God kicks Satan and a third of the angels out, and now they want to hurt God. How are they going to hurt God but to hurt the delicates, you know, of, of what he cares about? So God cares about the souls of men. He cares about people. And so the only way Satan can hurt God is to try to steal the people by trying to take them away from true religion that costs, like God says, it does according to his word. And they give them a different idea of it and gets them to follow the whore. So instead of God, instead of God getting to have what he loves and bring him close to him, he has to pour out his judgment, the same judgment that he's going to put on Satan and put it on the people he loves. That hurts God. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked will turn, turn ye, turn ye, for why will ye die? And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee. And all things which were dainty and goodly and de are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. So clearly they covered the base of everything. They were in control of everything. And that's what, I guess, Johnny Todd had mentioned, that there's 
four conglomerates overall that control basically everything in the world. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her stands shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Once again, you'll see that the judgment's happening upon them. So they're kind of keeping their distance, but they're still not happy because they know their whole life is ruined. It's like people failing in stocks. This is like a hundred times worse than that because that's only one guy falling. This is the whole world falling apart because God said, I'm done. You guys carried on in false religion and soulful religion way too long. And you never paid the price to be true to me. And you're still continually true to the Antichrist and the, and the devil. And saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For when one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by a sea stood afar off. Everybody's watching from a distance. What a disaster. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. She's destroyed in one hour. It's going to be the greatest disaster on earth is that one hour when the horror and the system is going to get ripped anew. The, the beast system is going to get destroyed. Now it changes. So like we said, we see uh, 18 kind of like it. the horror is going to fall. And then all the bad guys wailing over her falling. And now you're going to have the good guys rejoicing because of her falling. And that goes right on, right on into 19. Now let's look at that one. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Remember he said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. This is him repaying. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, thus with violence shall that great city be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. See how it's talking like it's already happened. Now it's talking like it's going to happen. It's kind of interesting. That's kind of, that's why, you know, this is a kind of a get up to speed chapter. It's actually two and a half chapters of getting up to speed to get the picture of what's happening right at the very end of the vials, which we had already seen. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatsoever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. Everything, even in the music, is all going to be coming to nothing now. And the light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by their sorceries were all nations deceived. That is scary stuff. The people who are ruling all the finance and even all the businesses of the world, the heads of industry, and they're all part of this thing. No describing how evil the people among this can be. A lot of us don't really realize we're still in the inspector gadget thing. Everything's fine. I'm not, nothing happened to me. But when it actually happens and it crosses your line and you see the injustice, it is shocking. You're like, I can't believe how bad it is. Until, until it really bites you in your current situation. It's almost like it's easier to not see it because you don't really want it to disrupt. Like these people didn't want it to disrupt on this earth shattering manner. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So they were killing the Israelites in the Old Testament. They were there was disaster happening in between the Old and New Testament with Maccabees. As you remember, that story was really radical. And even in the New Covenant, you see Rome and everybody, Nero, just slaughtering Christians. The Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Lollards, they're all getting slaughtered by, by Rome and what have you. It's horrible. The, the hiding in the catacombs and in, in the dungeons underground to try to get away so they wouldn't get fed to lions. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Amen. So now it's a voice from heaven 
a voice for much people in heaven. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. They all died because of her, and now God paid, them, paid her back for hurting his people. We don't have to pay back evil. God is going to do way worse than we could ever do. And plus, we won't be losing our salvation by filling up with bitterness, because bitterness leads to hell. And again, they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Those who go to hell, it's forever. The cults don't believe that, but that's what the Bible says. And also in 16, it says the smoke of her, the smoke of their torment ascended up forever as well. So clearly there's an eternal burning of wrath and there's also the temporary wrath, which we've seen like the on earth wrath, like we've covered before. And the four and 20 elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. So we got the four creatures, remember the 24 elders, uh, that's what we see that we seen in the early of the time when we saw the worship service So now the worship service is continuing as justice is being served at the end of the end here And a voice came out of the throne saying praise our God all ye his servants and ye that fear him both small and great Amen so, And another voice came out of the throne. So there must be other great people sitting on the throne maybe the four creatures or something 24 elders saying that another and a voice came out of the throne and saying that somebody was close to the throne and i heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a mighty as of mighty thundering saying alleluia for the lord god omnipotent reigneth like the worship service is continuing let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Amen. The bride of Christ is not just kicking her heels back. She's preparing herself for the bride. She's, she's preparing herself for the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb happens in heaven. And, and then there, people are going to come back down. They're going to be coming back down with, with the Lord as we're going to see. Because the, the, the judgment happens here. There's people in heaven. They're going to be coming back down with him. We're not going to cover that today. But... You remember that part's a pretty popular part of the timeline. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in the fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Amen. Like I said, we can pick a path. We can pick Satan's path and think like him and think like the world, which we can see, like, like a beast would act. Or you can follow the word of God that leads you to clean and white righteous life. You can get the word, it'll purify our lives. Get away from the word and our lives will get very dirty. You clean your life up by staying in the word. Stay around people who are fellowshipping with God, fellowshipping with each other in holiness and purity. They're clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. She makes herself ready. She clothes herself with righteousness by doing what is right and staying in the truth. And he saith unto me, write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God saith unto me, right? Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are the blessed people. They're going to be part of the, the marriage supper. And be safe from everything else and get to be blessed in heaven with the Lord. These true, these are the true sayings of God. And I've got one more verse we can look at. This is the verse before the horse comes down. So and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he saith unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So it looks like John is about right. John is trying to worship another man or an angel, and the angel refuses it, you know? Like how you see um, sometimes an angel, like if it's Christ and he shows up, in the Old Testament, he wouldn't refuse the, the worship, but angels don't receive it because they don't want to take the worship away from God. So since he was a he was a voice from the throne, maybe it kind of tricked him for a second, and he he cut him off and he says, "Don't don't worship me. I'm not God." For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I'm sure people could preach that blue part. I don't know what that really really means, but that's pretty cool. The, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
I guess that's the final finality of all the prophets. I mean, the whole Bible is all about that whole thing of the, the timeline and the finished works of the cross and the redemption through Christ and his blood. So that, that makes a lot of sense there. But he's not, re, he's, he's not receiving the worship because he, he's a just, just worship God. And so this is right before the, the time when Christ comes on the horse and carries out his, his duties right there and finalizing there. And so what I believe of this part here is is that you see the you know babylon is fallen and then it's also talking about it's about to fall because now your judgment is about to come something like this it gives you two different things meaning it's it's kind of like not exactly chronological you know but it's giving you all the points to get you up to speed with when christ comes down and it will show you at the end there it's pretty 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 radical because it shows at the end of 16 the vials are poured out and the earthquake happens and it also shows the the hail coming down and that and then it shows like i mean now you can see it catches you up to speed where christ is coming down after that but it kind of gives you some background before that happens but that's how it kind of happens over on the timeline of oral which we've seen several times so towards the end of that seven year period the saints are going to be in heaven the wedding supper of the lamb and then they get on the horses and come down and watch jesus destroy everything and finalize the judgment protecting Israel as he, as he always will, as he always has. So that's what we want to keep keep from tonight. That's that's 18 and part of 19. And what we can remember is that his people are separate. It says that they make themselves righteous. It didn't say that they were just forgiven. They, they actually put on righteousness clean and white. There are people in the Bible who are considered blameless before God. They have no guile in their mouth like Nathan, I think it was, and there was different people who were just blameless before God. There was, they were, they were innocent before the throne of God. It's kind of what we want to have our, our, our lives like that, you know? And like I said, when, when we start to, st if we're committing to stay around godly people, because we need other people to be around us to kind of, they, they can bring in things to keep our minds on track in ways that we can't do on our own. God never meant for the body of Christ to be a, a lone ranger too many lone rangers because they got a lot of strengths they think that they don't need to be around other people it's not true there's things that other people have that you don't have sometimes i used to turn out from the church because i think oh they don't know what they're doing i know what i'm doing and then i get around them sometimes and realize they're they got strengths that i don't have that i've been overlooking and that's why god says no we got it. my bride is is a people I know that there's two or three that gather in his name there that fits too but really his people is a, a family of families that's that's ideally what it is in the last days it's going to be a lot more complicated because there's a lot of attacks trying to mess everybody up but god's people is going to hold on god's going to cause us to overcome and to and to make it in the end but he wants us to to, to strive for the holiness and the purity that we can really have that real cutting during the great revivals, they didn't say, just believe. They didn't say, oh, soul is spirit. They didn't say this. They, they would talk in a ways because they said, I know the real cost and I'm not going to let up. I need to tell you the truth. It, it, you got to seek him until you find him. It's not about joining a denomination because denomination, in a way, I know that people sometimes are really full of the Holy Spirit and they have a title with it. But I believe that's like the last thing on their list to say, well, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Calvinist or I'm a Pentecostal or I'm a whatever reform. It doesn't all these different types of evangelical groups is not the issue. It's like, do you know Jesus Christ? Will you follow him everywhere he goes? Like like the 144,000 will. Will we will we be like this with, with Jesus? And the, the real cost of finding the real Jesus is so convicting to really know him is so convicting because he cuts and deals with us and deals with idols we didn't think matters. It's like, well, it doesn't matter if you want a soulful Christianity, but if you want New Testament Christianity, you'll realize why your TV should be off and your King James Bible should be open. You'll realize why you want to bridle your tongue and not just let anything come out because it will grieve your life. If we have a jaded soul, eventually we won't even notice anymore. And that's how Satan starts to work as we we're learning spiritual things of how Satan comes in a little bit. Just like I go to the mountains and I would make a little fire. And every time I'm working on it, try to build that little fire a little bit at a time. If you build it carefully, a little at a time, a little bit more, a little more, then it will build. And then you can put logs on there and the thing will just burn all night long. But you try to rush it, it'll just come and go. 
And that's how a lot of Christianity, they say, oh, here's a, this, here's a carnival ride, Christian. Sign up and you can't win and you fail and jump out. Sign up for Jesus real quick and then you leave really quick. Like the parable of the sower, they, they quickly lose interest. They grow up real fast and then they leave uprooted. But God wants his people to be take the real path of a little at a time and build it so it will be solid and it will get stronger over time, not uprooted quickly over time. We'll have the heart that is ready to hear his words and be ready to follow what he has for us. So we will be able to grow and be fruitful and, and glorify God in our lives. So that's it. That's the end of the Whore of Babylon. I'm going to have a lot more detailed thing going on later on when I do the entire book with a lot more pictures and, and everything else and, and kind of bouncing back through even more comparisons than this. This was a little bit kind of a quicker version of it, but it's still, it is pretty simple though. 18 and 19 is, is not that complicated and I haven't heard anybody carry on much further than that um, in, 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 the, in the teaching of itself. So let's go ahead and pray and let's go ahead and have our communion time now. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder of what you do require. Thank you for your word, Lord. It, it's sometimes very difficult to, to tune in sometimes. But Lord, we know that your way is the only way. And we know it's the narrow way that leads to life. And we want to train ourselves to be around that, which is going to renew our mind for your kingdom, Lord, and clothe ourselves with righteousness and be the bride that you really are proud of one that you can be proud of and that we will be there. We will be in heaven when, when the rapture happens. One will be taken and the other left. Lord, I pray that we're not the ones that's left, God. We're the ones that are not going to be regretting. Why did I do that? Why did I keep my head tuned over there? Oh, and we see people in, in real life. They're getting thrown in jail. They can't believe why did I do that? Because they trained their minds so much. To, to be full of the world and, the, and they weren't ready when it all came right down to it and then they missed it. God, please bring sobriety to your church, Lord. The carelessness has got to go. This modern preaching has got to go. This liberal preaching has got to go. Selling out to get paid and be popular, Lord, it's got to go. Lord, raise up men and women and children, Lord, that love you so much that just the way that they communicate, just the look on their face of beholding the beauty of Jesus will permeate through the hearts of those who are looking for that Philadelphia church so we can fall at their feet and worship along with them. Lord, I pray that the cost of salvation find salvation, to hold on to salvation, and to avoid the mark at the very end, Lord, it would be very, very clear to your people, Lord. No matter who says whatever, Lord, if it's not in the word, God, I pray that it would be rejected. If it's not the, if it's not the language of the fruitful, strongest points in Christianity, Lord, let it be rejected. It's not true. Lord, I pray that we would stop listening to fruitless Christianity and come back to the faithful Christianity, that we can behold you Behold your son, behold the Holy Ghost, and be renewed, Lord, to a Christianity that is ready to shake nations and to suffer anything for your gospel, no matter how hard it will be. Protect your people, Lord. And plead the blood of Jesus over every people, over all over your people, Lord, over your bride. Stopping the works of the devil, protecting them from every attack. Glorify your name, Lord, in us. We worship you in fullness, Lord in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. The strong and mighty Jehovah, who is the king of glory? Jehovah, strong and mighty. Jehovah, mighty in battle. Psalms 24, verse 8. Is thy heart faint? Thy strength but utter weakness? Behold the Lord Jehovah, he who reveals himself as strong and mighty, a soldier, a warrior with sufficient power to break down every opposition. Hear him say, my presence shall go with thee to conquer every foe. Strong and mighty Jehovah, give me victory over all the power of the enemy this day. Amen. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, 
is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Amen. You see the verbiage of Christ is bread, and we are the bread in one body. You see this unity that we have. And unity happens when we remember. And God wants us to take the time to pause and to reverence the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the wonder-working power of the precious blood of the Son of the living God. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Something we're going to continue to do. Not only do we want a constant cleansing in our own life, but we want a constant remembrance, and that's what the table of the Lord is all about. Let's thank the Lord for the great things he has done and will do continually with his power to bring us into the fold and the power to continually overcome the adversary as he tries to make his way into our lives. And we have the way by his blood to dispose of the enemy, dispose of Satan and kick him out of our homes and kick him out of our lives and out of our relationships in Jesus' name. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for tonight. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the faithfulness of thy dear Son. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to vanquish the darkness, setting us apart for your glory setting us apart to be lights in this dark world and that we can be the salt and light in this world and shine the light of Jesus Christ in this world that is losing their sensitivity, Lord. But we can show them so much, Lord, and you can you can pour out your glory upon them as we can sow, many will plant and you, Lord, will give the watering, Lord, and you'll give the increase, Lord. In Christ's name, we thank you today. Amen. For I know that my Redeemer loveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed with envy.
Romans 8, verse 38 to 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, mighty God, tonight. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your great compassion and helping us with so many sources, Lord, to help us be encouraged in that which is real in the spirit, Lord, that which is real in your mind and your in your will for us individually, Lord, your passion for us, your compassion for us, your empathy for us, Lord, <coughs> and the courage that you cause us to have, Lord, just by your spirit and uh, your word. A timely, a timely needed verse, dear Holy Father. Thank you and praise you for all you are and all that you have done. Receive your praise in our hearts, Lord, forever. In Christ's name we pray tonight. Amen. Amen.